Hey y'all, this is Brown at IF Brown, and tonight we are going to be talking about the movie Ghost Warrior on Blu-ray. So, Ghost Warrior was released in some areas under the title of Sword Kill, and it came out in 1984, but it wasn't until 1986 that it was released theatrically in the U.S. And so that's why some people, you know, if you, you know, ask them about, you know, the movie uh, Ghost Warrior, and, you know, they were around the 80s, they might be like, wait, what? But then you mention, uh, you know, a movie called Sword Kill, and they'll be like, oh yeah, I remember, I remember that, and, or something. And not to say that, you know, the Ghost Warrior was a, you know, huge hit or anything like that, but I'm just saying, you know, depending on the crowd and who you're talking to, um, you know, familiarity with this title, you know, varies depending on, you know, what it went by in, you know, which areas. And so it came out in 1984, but it wasn't until 1986 that it was released theatrically in the U.S. And that's why, um, once again, depending on who you talk to or, you know, where you're watching it, you know, the release date will be 1984 or 1986. So that out of the way, um, the, the uh, company uh, Kino Lorber, I hope I'm saying that name right, uh, Kino Lorber, um, they've uh, gone out of their way to uh, re-release a bunch of uh, movies that, you know, had been um, released previously, but usually, say, with, you know, bare-bones releases. Like, say, you know, the DVDs, you know, if, if a movie was out on DVD, you know, they're, they're, you'd be lucky to get, say, a theatrical trailer as a special feature. But then Kino Lorber you know, comes in, and they release re-release the same movie on Blu-ray, except you know they'll have some you know pretty good commentary tracks and other features sometimes. But usually um, it's the commentary track that you know makes um, a release from Kino Lorber um, worthwhile and checking out. And so um, you know Ghost Warrior was um, one of their latest releases, and so um, it. Um, Watching the movie first and then uh, watching it while listening to the commentary track makes for a very illuminating experience because you know, Ghost Warrior is one of those movies wherein you recognize that there are many flaws throughout the movie, but at the same time though, because of the um, strong performance by um, the main actor in the movie, uh, Hiroshi Fujioka, um, as the main character, um, you kind of find yourself, or at least in my experience, I found myself um, drawn into the story, um, you know, mainly because of um, Fujioka's performance. Whereas the rest of the movie, um, not to say it was necessarily a bad movie, but it's one of those things where you're watching it and, you know, you're already, you know, asking questions. And as the movie goes on. And granted, this is a B movie, make no mistake. And so to some degree, you do have to check your brain at the door. Now, to be fair, you could argue that you have to check your brain at the door anytime you watch a movie or read a book. You know, anytime fiction is involved, you have to check your brain at the door to some degree. You know, but even uh, with that in mind, there are a lot of problems in terms of logic, you know, within this movie. But that being said, though, you know, when they, they're they sort of uh, weighed against, um, you know, the performance of uh, Fujioka, it, it's, I'm not going to say, you know, Fujioka's performance uh, cancels those problems out, but it does um, make the movie worth watching, though. And Ghost Warrior is also one of those movies that, you know, it, it ranges... It varies between being, you know, a sort of ho-hum movie to a legitimately decent movie. Um, and there are elements in here wherein you, you know, you, you watch it, you watch the movie, and you see these elements, you know, coming to the forefront, and you realize that there is a much better movie, you know, trying to come out of here. But, unfortunately, you know, it just, it falls short of being good. But... Um, I've read some reviews um, after having seen this movie, and while I can understand where they're coming from, I do think that in some respects, you know, they sort of, uh, you know, uh, downplay um, 
the effectiveness of you know certain aspects of this movie or you know they sell the movie short in my opinion like they make it sound like it's a slog fest and so um i'm not gonna say it, you know it was a slog fest you know i just i i, I recognize that the movie is flawed and it could have been improved in many ways but for what it is, though, it's actually not a bad B-movie. I mean, not the best B-movie ever made or anything like that. But at the same time, you know, definitely not, um, you know, the slog fest that some reviews um, make it out to be. But uh, Ghost Warrior was um, one of many pic uh, movies um, that came out um, under the Empire Pictures uh, company. And Empire Pictures was kind of a B-movie empire. And, I mean, a lot of their movies, you know, were um, definitely, you know, in the schlock category. But some of them were actually pretty good. You know, you had movies like, you know, Reanimators, Trancers, um, depending on who you talk to, From Beyond, um, Zone Troopers. And um, one of my personal favorites from the company was a movie called Prison. Uh, which was one of the very first movies directed by Rennie Harlan, and in my opinion, it still remains one of his best. It also stars a very young Viggo Mortensen. So, if you like, you know, old school, you know, '80s horror movies um, with you know a very atmospheric environment, definitely check out Rennie Harlan's Prison, which is available on Blu-ray and DVD, um, you know, with special features on both media. So, um, some good movies did come out of Empire Pictures. And so, um, it was nice to see them, um, it was nice to see a, yet another, um, release of theirs, you know, being, um, shown to the public, you know, in a more, I guess you could say, um, visible release than say, you know, the, um, VHS format or say Bare Bones DVD, because for a long time, uh, Ghost Warrior was only available on VHS. And so, fast forward several years later, um, they uh, put it out on, like, I think, believe it was a double feature uh, DVD with another Empire Pictures um, movie as the other feature. I don't remember what it was, but I don't remember if there were any special features for that release. But it wasn't until, say, you know, now that they finally, um, you know, came out with, you know, a... Uh, movie a release for this movie specifically that had some special features on there so I, I was very glad to see that you know that another um another um little known uh movie from empire pictures is being uh reintroduced to the public and so that's always nice to see now whether it's a good movie or a bad movie or something in between i mean that's up to you the audience but um to, and to be fair um this definitely could have been a dud but it it's definitely not a dud like it's not a good movie but it's not say in the realm of uh empire's bad movies like say ghoulies or you know troll or something like that but um so uh the story itself i mean it's you know pretty simple you know this uh the samurai a guy by the name of uh this um his name was a uh, yes see yoshimitsu and you know in and back in you know feudal japan um you know he uh he he and his uh you know, wife uh were um attacked by um enemy soldiers and his wife was unfortunately killed and uh, Yoshimitsu um, actually puts up a pretty good fight against, you know, this um, enemy um, army, but he ends up getting mortally wounded and falling into a lake in which um, he, f you know, he freezes to death. And so, you know, over a period of time, um, a couple of uh, you know, skiers in Japan, you know, in the modern day, managed to find his frozen body in a cave and so, um, for reasons of B-movie logic, um, you know, Yoshimitsu's frozen body is brought to Los Angeles, uh, to a cryogenic research facility. And so, um, this particular, um, you know, scientific team is wanting to, you know, test to see whether they can, um, resurrect, um, a frozen corpse, you know, and so, um, you know, once they get Yoshimitsu's body, 
um, they uh, bring another person to the team, a, a woman by the name of, give me a sec here, um, Chris Wells, played by Janet Julian. And Janet Julian is a semi-familiar face. You, you might have seen her in the King of New York with Christopher Walken. But um, she's an interesting character because um, Chris um, is kind of an expert in, um, you know, Japanese, you know, weaponry as far as, you know, its historical significance and what have you. Um, but, you know, she's not necessarily the most fluent when it comes to, say, speaking Japanese, but, you know, they bring her on the team anyway. And the team is run by a guy named uh, Dr. Alan Richards, played by John Calvin. And he's um, definitely kind of a driven scientist. And he is, um, you know, basically, you know, working kind of under, you know, a time limit. But um, he and his team, they actually managed to um, bring the frozen samurai uh, back to life. And, you know, for a bit, you know, he's kind of in a coma and what have you. Um, but once, you know, he starts to, you know, come to and he wakes up, um, you know, they bring in uh, Chris to, you know, s you know, say, you know, try and, you know, calm things down and, you know, talk to him and, you know, test him. And, um, and then from what she can understand, you know, she, she calls him, um, Yoshi for short, as far as his name goes, you know, but the problem is, um, his language, it's, um, it's so archaic that even though it is Japanese, it's a form of dialect that hasn't been spoken in a very long time. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the words that she's getting from him are only bits and pieces that she can kind of understand. But the two of them, nonetheless, do become friends. And so, you know, she, you know, you know, does some tests that, you know, trying to see, you know, how his intellect is and what have you. And um, turns out that his intellect is actually pretty sharp. But it's just that, you know, he's unfamiliar with, you know, the world he's in now. And so um, things go amok when... Um, one of the people in this facility, you know, a guy who is wanting to um, sell um, this, you know, uh, resurrected samurai's, you know, battle gear, you know, you know, for money, um, tries to, you know, steal the guy's sword. And big mistake, the guy more or less gets cut in half um, in a rather low budget way. But he, um, but once this happens, uh, Yoshimitsu uh, leaves the facility and, you know, to be fair, when he killed the guy, it was in self-defense, but no one else at the facility knows this. And so, um, you know, Chris obviously is wanting to, you know, help Yoshi, uh, Yoshimitsu or Yoshi out, um, you know, because, you know, this is a guy who's a fish out of water and he's out in the, you know, modern world and has no idea of, you know, how to exist in it. Um, but, uh, the doctor, um, Dr. Richards, um, he gets it into his head that, um, if, if, you know, this, uh, resurrected samurais, you know, that, you know, they weren't supposed to, you know, be in possession of, uh, is going around killing people. Well, you know, they can't have that on their hands. And so, uh, he gets it into his head to, um, try and kill the guy, you know, so that way, you know, they can say that, well, um, you know, we don't know what's going on. And so, um, from there, um, it's sort of a, you know, the, the main thrust of the story is, um, Yoshimitsu, um, sort of, you know, wandering around the landscape of Los Angeles and in some instances helping some people out, uh, and most notably, um, an elderly Korean war vet, against uh, some marauding gang members. And on the other hand, you have Chris, um, you know, trying to, you know, find the, the poor guy. And in the process, um, you know, she, you know, talks with uh, this professor who uh, she usually goes to, um, 
you know, for information and advice on um, some of the ancient, you know, weapons and tools of, um, you know, Japanese history and what have you. And so um, this professor in particular um, was played by um, uh, Robert Kino, who was actually uh, in the movie Night of the Creeps um, as a rather unfortunate janitor. But seeing him here, though, in this movie, uh, in a rather more dignified role was kind of a surprise. So that was pretty cool. But anyway, um, you know, once he he's made aware of um, Yoshimitsu's existence, um, and once he's introduced to the guy, you know, he's you know, on one hand astonished, but he's kind of terrified at the same time because he's trying to tell Chris, he's like, you know, this guy can't exist. You know, th he, he's a ghost. Uh, because, you know, basically, you know, he's able to understand more of the language um, than a lot of the other people are. <laughs> and so, I mean, he still has some problems with it, but what he's able to understand of it, um, you know, this, he realized, he, I mean, he gets the distinct impression that Yoshimitsu is not faking it, and he's not insane because he has too much knowledge about, you know, the stuff that, you know, happened back then and what have you, you know, so, um, anyway, uh, that's, I mean, you could probably guess, you know, how the rest of the movie's going to go in the sense that, um, you know, Dr. Richards, um, you know, no, re no relation to, um, Miss, you know, Reed Richards from a Fantastic Four, you know, obviously, but, uh, Dr. Richards, though, um, you know, he's, you know, got his own underhanded um, schemes and trying to take out uh, Yoshimitsu. Um, and of course, you know, Chris and Yoshimitsu, you know, are on the run from them. And that's, you know, kind of the rest of the movie. But, um, so yeah, the movie, like in some ways it's very predictable, but in others though, um, it manages to kind of surprised the audience, or at least it kind of surprised me in some ways, you know, because, um, when it's focusing on, uh, Dr. Richards and his, um, bizarre scheme to, you know, try and kill this, you know, resurrected samurai, you know, that's where, you know, you're, you're constantly reminded that you're in a B movie wherein, you know, um, realistic logic you know, kind of, you know, goes by the wayside, you know, because, I mean, you have all sorts of questions of, okay, um, you know, if they're trying to, you know, resurrect this, you know, long dead samurai, why don't we get someone who speaks fluent Japanese, you know, on the off chance this guy actually does wake up, and as opposed to, say, um, this, you know, girl who, you know, I mean, yes, she's skilled in the history of, you know, certain weapons of, you know, Japan from certain eras, but, um, at the same time, you know, she only speaks a little bit of Japanese, you know, it's like a, for this, you know, sort of hush-hush project, I mean, wouldn't you want to get someone who actually speaks the language fluently or something like that? Um, and also, you know, his decision, you know, to, you know, try and kill the, have, or kill the samurai or at least have him killed, you know, just kind of comes out of nowhere because, I mean, on one hand, you're looking at him and he kind of looks like Gary Busey from Lethal Weapon. So maybe that's a tip off that, you know, he's, you know, going to be a bad guy. But at the same time, though, um, he initially, you know, seems like someone who's kind of a driven scientist who um, is willing to um, go beyond the limits in trying to resurrect this guy, you know, this long dead samurai. But then, um, once he gets his wish, you know, he instantly becomes hostile towards, you know, the exact same guy he just had resurrected. And so, you know, that it, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. And so, you know, and then going from that to, you know, instantly wanting to have him killed, you know, once he escapes the facility, I mean, this is definitely an instance where you're kind of like, okay, you know, this is definitely a high-tech, you know, facility to some degree, but at the same time, it doesn't seem to have anything in the way of security cameras or, you know, an adequate team, you know, to handle something like this, you know, like, say, an escaped 
um, test subject or something like that. Or say, you know, God forbid, one of their own employees tries to pull a fast one on, you know, said test subject, namely, you know, the employee who is wanting to try and, you know, steal the, you know, samurai sword, and, you know, for money. And so because there's no cameras in there, um, you know, they don't know the situation. Like they don't know that the samurai uh, was acting in self-defense. You know, they're just assuming that the samurai just randomly started, you know, slashing, you know, this employee up, you know, and so from there, you know, that's where it, it's rather strange because um, it's one of those, in your head, you're kind of like, man, I mean, these guys have all this money to, you know, have a scientific process to bring, you know, a frozen, you know, dead guy back to life, but they don't have the foresight to have, you know, basic security measures in place. And so at the same time, though, this negligence does result in, say, a series of tragic events, you know, or I guess you could say it, it results in a long, you know, tragic journey for this samurai because, you know, everyone is, you know, with the exception of Chris, is thinking that he's, you know, just randomly going around hacking people up. And even when, say, you know, certain people are trying to say, no, this guy was actually trying to help so-and-so, you know, it's like, you know, Dr. Richards is able to spin the story that, no, this man's a homicidal maniac and what have you, all because they didn't have security cameras in the place. <laughs> and so um, as the story goes on, you know, you get the impression that, you know, um, Yoshi's story is not going to have a happy ending. And one thing I will say um, is that when the ending does come, you know, as, as, as much as, you know, the movie, you know, fails at being good, I will give them credit for, you know, having a genuinely tragic ending, you know, for, um, you know, certain parties. And, you know, because this kind of movie or the mo the time period that this movie came out i mean it probably you know would have been more at home where wherein if they had had say um a you know uh, i guess you could say more of a goofy atmosphere and yoshi you know you know f um having you know comedic escapades in the city of los angeles or something like that but the movie doesn't do that though and so it goes from being, you know, a, a, a movie where you're sort of, you know, face palming yourself at, you know, at the, you know, complete negligence of this cryogenic institute, um, and as well as, you know, um, you know, scratching your head, you know, in uh, confusion at, at, you know, um, the main bad guy's logic and trying to have the samurai killed. I mean, you go from that to, you know, whenever um, Yoshimitsu is the focus, um, whenever he's, you know, wandering the city, that's when you get a glimpse of the better movie that this could have been, you know, because um, Fujioka does a really good job of playing um, a man out of time, you know, uh, you know like a, a, a samurai specifically, and, you know, he has a very, you know, noble bearing about him, but he's also, you know, on edge because of this unfamiliar land he's in. And one of the things I like about um, not just him, but, you know, the choice of dialogue is the fact that whenever he speaks Japanese, there's, there are no subtitles. And at first I was thinking, you know, it was like a, there, there was some sort of, you know, goof on the subtitles. But the thing is, it's like, they they were trying to i think you know put the viewer in the same shoes as um yoshimitsu and um or or and vice versa you know because it's like you know if you don't understand a, a foreign language i mean in real life i mean it's not like you're going to understand what they're saying you know in fiction unless you have subtitles but you know it just kind of um adds to that fish out of the water feel and it, it's only when um, he interacts with people who, um, 
are Japanese that some of what he's saying is be, finally able to be understood, um, at least as far as you know words go. But um, and one of the things I really liked uh, was his friendship with the um, elderly Korean war vet, uh, played by the late uh, uh, Charles Lumpkin. And he was in a movie, Cocoon, that was directed by Ron Howard, amongst other things. But um, I really liked his character, and I really wish that, you know, he had been in the movie for uh, longer than he actually was. But for the amount of time he's in the movie, um, he definitely adds to uh, Yoshimitsu's story, because um, the two of them form an unlikely friendship in the sense that... Um, you know, he, uh, his character, um, his, his character's name was Willie. Um, Willie doesn't speak Japanese, um, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, he's grateful for, um, Yoshimitsu saving his life from, you know, these, you know, roving hooligans, uh, and gang members. And so, um, you know, he takes him to a, a sushi joint, um, to see if, you know, maybe, you know, he's thinking like the guy has amnesia or something like that. Um, but he takes him to a sushi joint, you know, seeing if, you know, being in a, you know, familiar environment or, or something with an element of, you know, you know, Japanese um, culture would help to jog his memory. And in fact, in a way it does. And that part of the movie I thought was very fascinating in terms of acting and also it was a bit of logic that, in the context of the movie, actually made a lot of sense, and it made way more sense than you know the logic of the of the scientific part of the movie. So, um, so yeah, I really liked um, the friendship between uh, Yoshimitsu and Willie, and um, in fact, uh, there's a nice little bit where you know Willie you know is introducing himself to him. And, you know, he tries to shake his hand and, you know, Yoshimitsu's like, you know, he doesn't know what to do with that. But it isn't until, you know, they finally, you know, part company under harsh circumstances, um, mainly, mainly because, um, you know, the gang that was um, harassing Willie, you know, try and uh, take a, you know, pot shot at uh, Yoshimitsu. Like, they lure him into a trap and... Um, you know, Willie actually, you know, tries to help him out, um, and gets hurt, but, um, he doesn't die, thankfully. I mean, he, he's, he lives, but, you know, the police are coming, and so, you know, he, he's trying to tell, you know, Yoshi, Yoshi to, you know, get out of there, and so, and once Yoshimitsu does, you know, at the behest of, um, Chris, um, who's finally managed to track him down at this point, um, you know, he agrees to go along, go because, you know, she's probably like the one other friend he has. But before he goes, though, you know, he sort of um, awkwardly holds out his hand to Willie, you know, because he remembers that that seemed to be a gesture of friendship. And so, you know, even though it's there, the parting is under, you know, harsh circumstances in the sense that, you know, Willie, you know, is, you know, hurt pretty bad, but you know, since help's on the way, he's going to survive, you know, at least, I mean, they are able to still part as friends, and I like that, and so, um, and I kind of liked, um, the character of Chris as played by, uh, let's see, yeah, Janet Julian, um, because while she kind of goes along with the flawed logic of the, you know, scientific department in this movie, uh, and also, you're kind of questioning, well, it's like, well, uh, you know, why don't they just get someone who's wholly fluent in Japanese as opposed to just some random person who may speak a little bit of it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I kind of liked her character because of a certain sincerity in her efforts to um, help Yoshimitsu, you know, get his bearings in this modern world. Like, she's, you know, trying to show him that... Um, you know, like, like he's among friends. I mean, even though, unfortunately, he turns out not to be. But in her case, like, she actually is his friend. And so I like their, you know, budding friendship. And they sidestep the cliche of having him fall in love with her. 
you know, but one of the things that was pointed out in the commentary was, um, you know, they would have liked to have um, had it to where, say, for instance, um, you know, Yoshimitsu's wandering the city and, you know, he sees a woman that looks like his, you know, long dead wife, you know, but then it turns out, obviously, it's not her. It's just a woman who happens to look like her or something like that and maybe have, you know, um, have Chris, you know, try and, you know, call talk him down and, and explain that, hey, you know, she's not who you think she is, you know, something like that. I mean, that would have been, you know, nice to see. But, you know, even though they, you know, they didn't go for that, which would have been a nice touch, I mean, it's still, in a strange sort of way, kind of endearing, you know, having, you know, her, um, you know, her character being a genuinely, you know, noble um individual that kind of stands out in the you know bizarre you know criminal scheme of the scientific department so um another thing is uh, when it comes to the action um it, in some respects the action is fairly well done like when it comes to say like the flashback at the very beginning when uh, yoshimitsu's you know squaring off against multiple soldiers um the fight choreography is actually pretty good and i would even say that um Whenever, you know, he's going up against uh, the roving gang, um, you also have some, you know, memorable moments of um, movement. And um, there's one instance of blood and gore wherein he cuts one guy's arm off, or actually it might have just been his hand, but still it was kind of, okay, that was pretty cool. Um, but for the most part, though, when it comes to the violence, it's very um, sparse, like, You'll, you'll, you can tell that someone's been, you know, hit with a sword or, or slashed with a sword or something like that. Um, but there's not much in the way of blood and gore. It's just like, you know, the person's, you know, dead. You know, and you know that it was not a pretty way to go. You know, that kind of thing. Um, although I will say, um, towards the end of the movie, there is a rather brief but brutal kill um, wherein, you know, Yoshimitsu slashes this one character, you know, like, n not like a down the middle, but like, like that. And, you know, the blood and gore, you know, as brief as it is, it's kind of like, whoa, you know, and you remember that, yeah, this is a, this guy is a trained, you know, soldier, even though he's from another time, you know, he knows how to kill people. <laughs> and so, uh, but thankfully, he's not a bloodthirsty madman like, you know, the bad guys are trying to make him out to be. But at the same time, the push comes to shove, you're going to lose. But, but yeah, so, you know, the violence in some ways I thought was, or the action, I should say, in some ways was well done in the sense of, you know, the choreography uh, as far as Fujioka's choreography goes. Uh, but at the same time, though, I, I think that they... Um, could have stood to, you know, have some more, you know, blood and gore. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying, you know, make an all-out gore fest, but at the same time, this is a guy, you know, with a sword, you know, going up against, you know, people with, you know, guns and chains and what have you. And, you know, having a trained samurai go up against those kind of opponents, you know, it would have been cooler if you'd gotten to see more of the damage done other than the brief bits that we got. So... Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's not the good, it's not, it's not the movie that it could have been, but at the same time, I'm not going to say it was a bad movie. And I would even say like, as far as rentals go, uh, it's definitely a worthwhile rental. Um, I don't know if I would buy this movie, but you know, for, for, you know, the chance to see it, you know, it was a good rental though. And, um, the commentary track was actually pretty good too. And usually I don't, I mean, I'm sort of uh, picky when it comes to, you know, listening to commentary tracks all the way through, but you know, I kind of had some time to kill. So, you know, I did that. And so the commentary is by um, these two guys, uh, you know, uh, Brandon Bentley and Mike Leader. And so I, I don't know a whole lot about them, I'm sorry to say, but they put together a rather interesting commentary track because um, in some ways, I mean, you get the impression that they didn't necessarily in, like the movie, but at the same time, they were kind of fascinated with it because um, in some respects, the movie's at home with, you know, 
other movies wherein you have a fish out of water, you know, courtesy of cryogenics, you know, in some way or another. And also, um, they talk about, you know, the missed opportunities that the movie had, you know, because, I mean, you have instances, you know, wherein you see that they could have gone all sorts of different directions and it definitely would have been a better movie but because they didn't you know we're kind of stuck with the movie that we got and it just depends on depending on you you know you may or may not you know actually be able to see you know the better movie come out you know from time to time you know within you know this movie but at the same time though you know it was fascinating, you know, listening to them talk about it, you know, because they took go into the history of it as well as, you know, you know, certain aspects of it that, you know, are, are kind of familiar um, with in, in a sense of, you know, audiences having seen similar movies in some some form of fashion. But um, there's also an interview with, um, you know, a special uh, makeup effects artist, a guy by the name of uh, Robert Short. And, you know, he talks a little bit about, you know, his career and what have you, and also, you know, his work on the movie. And, I mean, it's just a, you know, couple of minutes long. So, I mean, it's interesting, but, I mean, nothing special in and of itself. But, uh, so the main draw is, def as far as special features go, is definitely the commentary track. Because um, it's a fascinating one in the sense that you learn more about the movie, uh, and about the behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, but... Uh, it's also, you know, fascinating, you know, listening to these guys, you know, bringing up some valid points about, you know, as far as criticisms go. But at the same time, though, I mean, it's you don't get the impression that they hate the movie or anything like that. And one of the things that they're very clear about is, you know, if there's one good thing about this movie, you know, that can be agreed upon. It's uh, Fujioka's, you know, lead performance in here because he plays his part very well. And so I, I appreciated that at least. Um, and one other thing I will say I liked about this movie is um, uh, the, 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 the music uh, for the movie that was composed by um, Richard Band, who is not only one, um, the brother of, uh, you know, Empire, you know, mastermind Charles Band and the son, the other son of uh, Albert Band, uh, but he's also, um, you know, done the score for, you know, several movies that came out of Empire Pictures and also um, Full Moon Pictures as well. And so, um, you know, the kind of score they did here um, was fairly subdued compared to the type of stuff that was, that he, compared to the type of movies that he usually did work for at the time. Um, but you listen to it though and you can definitely you know tell that you know he was trying to um make a you know score you know that would you know emphasize you know i guess you could say the cultural aspects of you know you know a, a japanese warrior out of you know his time and trapped in ours and you know in the score in in some ways in certain scenes kind of you know helps to you know, get the audience into the mindset of the character, even though, you know, he doesn't speak English, and, you know, there are no subtitles, but it's like, you know, his performance and the music in some scenes go very well together and convey a lot, so that's, that is something else I'll say that I liked about the movie, but, um, I'm gonna go ahead and give, um, you know, Ghost Warrior three out of five stars, um, it was, it was, in some ways, it was a disappointment, but others, you know, there were there were aspects of the movie that managed to, you know, make it worthwhile, in my opinion. Like, that to where, you know, even though it was a disappointment in a sense of, you know, missing certain opportunities, um, the fact that um, Fujioka's um, lead performance, you know, sort of carries the movie, I think is definitely something that, you know, made it worth watching. Um, so, um, I, if they were to, you know, remake this movie, I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't be opposed to it because there were so many ways they could have, imp you know, improved it and you know, especially nowadays, you know, but, uh, for an eighties B movie though, it's, it's a decent movie. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know about 
you know, full on buying it, but it was definitely worth a rental. So yeah, Ghost Warrior, three out of five stars. You know, you know, uh, a ho hum to you know decent movie all around, uh, but with a really good commentary track. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to you know check out my review. Um, I hope you you enjoyed it, and if you like what you see here, please feel free to like and subscribe. So y'all take care. Good night. Bye.